Are you two? Two up productions per cents. <laughs> okay. So, hello and welcome to the AUT Film Club Flash Forward, where we'll be reviewing a series of films with neo noir, dystopian, sci fi elements to them. We have in our team Juan Pablo Beltran, Jessica Chalmers, Connor Lee, and Hi. Paul Nabois. And we'll be reviewing four films, which are Air and a Half by Federico Fellini, released in 1963. Blade Runner in 1982 by Ridley Scott, Brazil by Terry Gilliam in 85, and Dr. Horrible Single on Block in 2008 in the writer's strike. First, we'll start with Eight and a Half, which was directed by Federico Fellini right after his grand masterpiece of La Dolce Vita, in which uh, Marcello Mastroianni is cast as the character Guido, who is perhaps like the director himself, Fellini, is a character, also a director, who does not know which film to make. It's pulled in all these different directions by everyone in the film set, by the producer, the actor, his wife, his mistress, by everyone. So where does he go? Into his dreams. Mm -hmm. And we see a lot of dream sequences throughout the film. Are these dream sequences effective, Jessica? I do think they were effective. Um, it, they did confuse the audience a little bit, but maybe that's what I was trying to do. Um, and you couldn't really tell what was real, what was the memory, and what was his dreams. Um, so I think that's a good way to betray what Ryder's block is or what he's going through because he's so confused about every aspect of his life, um, the film that he's making, and his personal life as well. Cool. We were discussing uh, about these dream sequences. What um, is the meaning of this? As, as Jessica said, the movie is quite complicated, it's yeah. quite um, like at a high level, so mm -hmm. the end was really a bit confusing if you're like just a viewer, mm -hmm. an ordinary viewer. It's, it's really hard to know if he's like dead or like he's dreaming again yeah. in his fantasy. Because maybe he, he just wanted to escape like for, for freedom because of that. Indeed, that escape to freedom is a big part of the the theme throughout the film. Yeah. Now, Connor, there's this scene in which he's seemingly flying off, mm -hmm. he's free, he's happy, and then he gets pulled down. I believe that's by the producer, he gets pulled down into Earth. Is that a, a metaphor for what's happening in things like Yes, yeah, so that's at the start of the film. So it starts, he's in his car, and then gas starts going to his car, and he starts coughing and dying. And he's surrounded, he's basically in a traffic jam, and everyone's looking at him. And so that's sort of a metaphor for where he is at that point in time. Where everyone is expecting him because he, he, he is this great to create this great movie and there's all these expectations on him and then he is able to escape so that is what he wants he wants freedom he wants to get away from all this grind all these people all these expectations and then when he thinks he is free when he thinks he is flying away as you mentioned he is pulled down he is dragged back down to earth and that is a theme throughout the film that he when, whenever he is going through these moments he does escape and that's how he said at the end, we don't know if he did sort of sort of kill himself because that is the sort of catalyst of it where he is wanting to escape but he's just unable to. Yeah, so it could be part of his dream that he try um, he imagines killing himself, which yeah, is the escape from everything. Or possibly yeah, all the sure. pressure actually got to him yeah. and he was like, Yeah, I'm done. Yeah. Well, uh, it is it is a film with uh, a lot of symbolism, a lot of layers mm -hmm. on layers. Um, but definitely has a trademark of Fellini, which he developed with La Dolce Vita, which was much more symbolic, a lot of image based, uh, instead of the neorealism of previous films like La Strada. And it has that very Italian style of the times, which uh, is where they, where they make everything flow a lot, because they, they don't actually dub, they don't actually record audio on the set, they do it post sync And they have music playing throughout the but the film, which is why you can see Guido walking in such a glowy way and everyone has this sort of vibing to them, which is quite nice. And I guess that's why it's also hard to determine what's real and what's a dream, because it flows right. into each other. You know, like, where does it stop? Okay, and now we will discuss uh, Blade Runner by Ridley Scott, released in 1982. We'll be doing the final cut, which has an ending that is definitely less hollywood yeah, a, better, a better ending for sure. We don't get the initial narration by Harrison Ford or the, the, or very, half, the very half hearted I didn't know very how much time I had yeah. with Rachel, yeah. <laughs> but no you, one does. You can see Harrison Ford really struggling to deliver yeah, his he, life. It's he believes it about as much as the body.
seems to be the problem. I want more life. So, gladly we saw this better cut of the film. And we see Rick Deckard, who is a, a Blade Runner, who hunts down replicants or androids who escape from the off-world. These androids, these replicants, they're slave labor. They're strong and they have uh, good capabilities that may be used to. If they develop uh, feelings of self-awareness, perhaps they will rise against humanity. They're, they're only given a, a four-year lifespan because like you said, they, they are strong and they do look like us. So what would stop them, if given a human lifespan, what would stop them from overcoming us? Which seems to be the reason why the creator of them, Tyrell, did this. But it does contradict at the ending because the mm -hmm. Ritz can't save him yeah. in the end. Yeah. And he has to empathy yeah. towards humans. Yeah, which is something that would contradict the typical robot stereotype. Yeah, like it, they're going to take over and kill us all. Yeah, it, 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 yeah that, that, that's what we're told. And whereas the contradiction is the robot seems to be the one that shows the emotion, whereas the creator, Tyrell, is the robot. Acting. Yeah, exactly. The one that you know, just gives him a four-year lifespan and he just churns him out continuously, continuously, and uses him as slave labor. He, and we don't even know if he is a replicant, but he, he seems to be acting in the stereotypical way that we believe one of them would have. What do you think of this four-year long run for the lives, and is it, is it fair for these, for these replicants to live for so little, for so short a life? Well, that's sort of one of the main ideas that the film brings up. Do these androids or replicants that are so close to humans, do they deserve human rights? Should they be treated this way, just shipped off to another world so we don't have to look at them and we don't have to think about what's happening to them? But technically, they're so close to humans, and they would even develop empathy if they lived. That reminds us of, uh, of another thing, which is a big theme in the book that is based on by Phil Kedek, to Andrew's dream of electric ship. It's a lot of animal imagery there, and uh, a lot of symbolism that's not used as much in the film. But it relates to whether androids replicants should have, uh, you know, rights, just as much as animals perhaps do, because they seem to show empathy and intelligence and relationships and love. So we see that these androids, in fact, they don't have any rights. They can be killed after four years. So, Connor, what do you think of um, Angel's character? Well, because Angel was the one that seems to sum up the replicants best, because we are told that you know they have no emotion, that they're physically strong, that they, you know, if, if left to live, they could take over, which you know, he, he and he does this place by killing Tyrell, you know, the creator, the one that gave him this kind of cursed life, you would say. And then when given the chance to kill the main character, Rick Deckard, he has no reason to, because Rick Deckard even killed um, one of his closest replicants. He, he did save him, you know, he displayed emotion, he displayed, you know, intrinsically like a soul, something that a good human would do. Yeah, and, and it's like, who is the good guy here if he's the one saving the human? Exactly. And the, the androids are meant to be the bad ones. Exactly. Yeah, and it completely contradicts what, you know, every stereotype regarding, you know, robots. robots are. You know, they're meant to have no emotion, they're meant to be cold, you know, kill humans on site, blah, blah, blah. They're going to take over the world. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But in fact, the only test that in the film and the book they have for seeing who is a human and who is a replica is the empathy test. The exactly. empathy test. And we can see that perhaps Angel at the end of the film would what pass this test yeah. because he develops a deep yeah. sense of empathy. And if you were to judge even on that film, you would probably get it wrong regarding who is a replicant and who is a human. You think this imagery of greedy, cyberpunk, futuristic is effective with cultures combined? I think if it's in the movie, it is effective. It is a really good. Well, for their time, it does look futuristic. And it's a successful one. I think Which it's, 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 five, it's in five, five years' yeah. time. Yeah. So it's kind of scary to think that but we're going to have. We're getting really close to that. Yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, it's, you see those huge buildings, you see the talking billboards. Yeah. And there are yeah. robots now that can simulate empathy as well. Yeah, yeah. The, the, I'd say that it's it's different. Red chat, those robots. The ones in the film is that they 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 look like robots. We know, yes. you know, yes. yeah, exactly. But but whereas these ones in the film look exactly like humans, but they're just not afforded the same ones as humans. They're not treated the same. And even though we've said all this stuff, maybe they should have rights. How would you actually feel if they were living among us? 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to think yeah, about. It's, it's easy to say remove from the situation, mm. but whereas if they were in a society, whereas they are stronger than you, you know, they, they would threaten your way of life, which is why they have been given this four year lifespan mm. sort of to stop them from being the dominant race. That's right. And that's why this one topic that will remain very useful for us in the coming years as technology yeah. progresses and we develop more human like yeah. androids. Yeah. For our next film, we'll be reviewing Brazil, directed by Terry Gilliam, came out in 1985. It's a, a very strange film. Um, there's a lot of metaphor, a lot of elements uh, alluding to bureaucracy, mainly, and the powers that uh, autocratic, uh, tyrannical governments may have on their populations, yeah. and a lot of dots. <laughs> this way. It's about rights of fantasy and the nightmare of reality. We're all in this together. Terrorist bombings. So in this scene we watch uh, a character, a bottle, getting abducted by wrong by of officials. Wrongly as well, which sets up the whole, the whole film. And now it seems like they didn't even care about getting this innocent guy. What does it say about the, the population in this film? Wow. It kind of shows you how little they care for the yeah for human life. It doesn't really mean much to them. Like later, the, um, the later Sam goes and gives the wife a check for her husband. Sorry, we made a mistake. Husband's dead, That's but it. here's a check. Is, is it's all good now. Dead, yeah. yeah, and it's a very it's scary idea. Like imagine living like that. You could just be taken on Christmas Eve. I think it was from your family and tortured and killed. No crowd. No crowd. He was innocent. Indeed, like with the taking away the innocent man, there's really small regard for human life in the film. We see in the explosions in the restaurant, yeah. in the yeah. shopping center. No, no really is better than either at all. Like, they, 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 just, they just sort of cover, even though there's people dying, you know, crying all, all around and they just continue to meal like nothing happened because those people aren't important to me. It's not only just the government that doesn't care about human life, but it's the people itself that don't care about each other anymore. And the only one that actually cares about the terrorist attacks is Jill, the character. When she's introduced, she's actually the one that tries to help people. Right. The one that's living up to it. Although, although seemingly Sam does care about human life, but he won't act, he won't do anything in his real life. In, in his dreams, uh, that is when he is the hero, that is when he does want to save people. Just, Specifically, Jill. Like, yeah. uh, like Ellen have, uh, Brazil has a lot of dream sequences as well, uh, in which Jonathan Price's character of Sam is unlike his real life character. He's a hero. He's got angel wings, he's got the armor, he's fighting off uh, giant samurai monsters, and he's rescuing his uh, love, his life, Jill, who he hasn't met yet in the film. And he's a hero. Now, in real life, he, he is not. He keeps his head down. In fact, he's being uh, controlled by his mother, who may be a metaphor for the government. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Cool. What do you think of the mother's character on, on Sam? I think she's also, as you said, personification of the government. And she controls his son because she's this rich, she's this powerful. Remember when she walked into that um, operator thing? And it broke. She just doesn't care. And hits the card as well. Yeah. Yeah. When, when yeah. I, I think he tries to take the bag or something, and then yeah. she actually refuses. Oh yeah, that's right. She just yeah. 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 And she's also very materialistic. Eh? Yeah. Can you just face cares about her face, and yeah. it, it's like, is the world gonna come to this? And her friend yeah. dies from plastic <laughs> surgery or so some weird acid, yeah. some acid or something that the doctor was putting. But she never seemed to be uh, sad about it. Just before yeah. dying, she was like, she oh was yeah, good. my face looks horrible, but it's a new, there's a new treatment. Let's, yeah, yeah. Let's it's going to be good. The doctor, says it's, the doctor says it's fine, ends up dying. Yeah, I, I, I think the lack of caring about human life is best summed up by Sam's friend Jack when he goes to visit him. So he, he goes into this office, first he meets his secretary, who's typing on the typewriter. Oh. All this thing, typing verbatim while the victim is sort of screaming. You know, Ouch! Yeah, 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 basically going through. And then he meets his friend Sam, who's, who's covered in blood. You know, he, he's, it seems like he's just... Just another thing for him. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. just finished with the victim. Yeah. And then he just sits down and his daughter's playing there with toys. Like, just right, don't. here he is, yeah. like, the character with blood all over the place being tortured, and the daughter's just there. And it's completely normal. Yeah. It's really normal. 
they're just ignoring the fact of, of what they're actually doing. They don't care that they're torturing they're somebody. Ignoring. It's just it's just work, you know? It's just, yeah. it's just one, one other thing uh, that we didn't mention, the other hero is actually Tuttle, the one that the government is meant to get, but they actually didn't write Tuttle, thanks to the dead fly. So, <laughs> so he escapes, and then he kind of saves Sam a few times. And then after he does, he kind of swings away like mm -hmm. Spider-Man, which yeah. is one of the... That's Robert De Niro's character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which he seems to be like Josh. They both seem to be kind of free in a way. They both live off the grid of the dark world. So and and um, the end in his fantasy, yeah. Robert De Niro comes and saves him, right? That's right. When he's being tortured, they all come and they're like, we're yeah. here to save you. <laughs> or does his best to save him. In yeah. fact, the saving sequence is part of, at the end, you will realize that it's actually all a dream. Yeah. He did not get saved, in fact, by him. Because uh, this character of Tapu was actually killed yeah. by a very direct uh, <laughs> metaphor for bureaucracy. He was literally overwhelmed, overweighted by paper. paper. <laughs> mm. Great way to die. <laughs> yeah. well, cause I, I was saying in the end, um, I don't know what you guys think, but it, it, it looked like it could have ended on a happy ending. Because yeah. he, he, he gets with Jill, that, that is what he sort of dreamed of the entire film. And then it's happy, and it could have ended then. But then, you know, going along the theme of film, film like, no, this isn't ending here. And then sort of the soldiers drop in and then sort of every, everything goes. I loved how it ended on that note, because um, it's not the typical happy ending, you know? It's like, actually, <laughs> he's still being tortured, yeah, none of that happened. It's happens. a horrible world. You, you <laughs> could have believed it, like you were saying, yeah. because that's what it was building up to. The whole time there was this happy romantic thing going on with Jill, but no, actually, you're, st you're just crazy, pretty much. Yeah, you're still being tortured. Yeah, so basically, Jill gets killed. <laughs> Harry Tucker gets killed. He, he, he gets the bottom line. He's pretty much there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, what was the album? <laughs> and it's from, from his best friend, friend as well. Okay. His best friend Jack is the one who's torturing him. But at this point, it's a happy ending. Yeah, mm. yeah exactly. <laughs> He's happy. Yeah. yeah, in fact, at the end of the, the film, we see a plaque somewhere that says the truth will set you free. And at least for Sam, his little truth, his little love bottom line spine, is that he was free with his girlfriend in a happy world. Right. When in reality, it's a world where no one is free, no one has escaped, particularly from the dots. Now that's one thing we haven't mentioned. Throughout the whole film, especially in the houses, in the buildings, everywhere, everywhere except the government building. What's up with all the dots? Yeah, because it's meant to be set in the future. It's right. And they have, is it? It's, it's yeah. meant to, it's in the future, and it, it's meant to represent, uh, Victor Gilliam was saying that it represents modernity and how these dots connect all these appliances, as in the, the alarm went up at the beginning of the film, and then every appliance was going up as well. Everything's connected, while at the same time it's not working. It's all going in crazy directions, it's chaos. So these dogs, they, they're meant to represent the connectivity and the modernity, yeah. while it actually looks really ugly. Yeah, yeah cool. because they are, as you mentioned, they are omnipresent from the everywhere, and that seems to be that sort of, that surveillance, that, that's keeping an idea, and that sends all the information back to the government, and that's what they use to, you know, sort of bring the people to justice, you know, or their terms of justice, which is torturing and killing them like what they did to Mr. Button. We can still relate to that today because we are being surveilled, but mm. it was. <laughs> very real. <laughs> <laughs> we can relate to that today because of the surveillance from the government. Um, there's a profile on everyone, on everything you've ever done on the internet, which is which relates to the Ducks because they're living in this world that is so controlled by the government that if there's a tiny mistake, you could end up dead. Mm or, you know, captured, tortured. Yeah, that's right. I like the film that it's heavily influenced by the novel by George Orwell, 1984. It is uh, very important that we take notice of this government uh, oversight that perhaps extends its reach too far. And eventually we might end up in a world like Brazil where we have no personal freedom. Uh, you know, yeah. It's a bit scary after it's watching scary. it. You're like, yeah. please don't do yeah. that like that. Yeah. <laughs> Now for our last film review, we'll be doing uh, Joss Whedon's Dr. Horrible single up block, mm -hmm. which has Neil Patrick Harris as Dr. Horrible, and uh, Nathan Fillion as Captain Hammer. <laughs> was done in the 2008 writers strike. There was no writers and just when he decided with his friends to just shoot a little little fun musical film. What, what do you think of the musical aspect? Uh, 
cool. Uh, I think I love the music. Um, I love the way it's made. I love the concept of it, like the concept and stuff. How they blend with each other, you know, different lyrics, but still we um, harmonize between the two, um, Dr. Hobo and Penny. Yeah. How they um, manage to take that sweetly. Like, yeah, that was really clever. Yeah. And the laundry, when we're in the laundry, hmm. Dr. Hobo's, uh, that was brilliant. Yeah, yeah, really? That time. Yeah. Is that after you got off yeah. uh, Dr. Hobo? How he was expressing his feelings through the song instead of just oh, thinking of it or. Yeah, well, because he, 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 as you can kind of get it, he's unable to express his feelings through words because he's assuming he's seen it or a lot, but he's never been able to say something to it. But and he kind of goes into a dream sequence because he, he's he's able to sort of sing to it, and you know that they, they he's talking to his kissing to it while in the sequence, but then in real life, you know, he's probably just standing there, just staring at it, you know, weirdly. <laughs> just staring into yeah. the distance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just like, yeah. Um, did those that relationship itself, uh, Penny with Billy, is a big part of the that relationship is a big part of the, the film. Mm -hmm. So you have you have Doctor Horrible, and that's the villain. I mean, his name is Doctor Horrible. He wants to be part of the evil League of Evil, mm -hmm. headed by a bad horse. <laughs> it's an actual horse, and so he he's evil, but by name. And you see that he's evil because his occupation is being an evil villain. But all his actions seem to be quite quite good. And in fact, we see through his Rodrigo and Billy when he's talking to Penny that he just wants to find true love. Mm. Now, he's sweetheart. He's sweetheart, yeah. And then Captain Hammer walks in and he's this big archetypal hero. Yeah. You know, he saves the day and all of this, but actually he seems to have... He's actually a dick. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's not a typical hero. He's all physically he is, but yeah. he's extremely superficial. So it's like... Uh, stereotype is reversed there, and yeah, yeah. um, we yeah. relate to the bad guy. So cool. yeah. We, um, yeah, did we watch uh, Captain Horrible lose his last shred of humanity when uh, Penny dies along with Billy, mm -hmm. uh, the soft side of Captain Horrible. Now, there's a lot of comedy in this. I mean, it is a musical comedy, yeah. mm -hmm. and you find you find it here, and then entertaining. Did you like it? I found it insane. I mean, he's not the typical evil. Evil character that you see. Every He's time, got a right? yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's he, he, he even got the sweetie best friend. Yeah, yeah. He's, He's cute. Yeah. You yeah. just yeah. want to be like, oh, you want to be evil? That's so yeah. cute. <laughs> Honestly, I thought it's gonna be like boring class again, boring movie that we're gonna watch. Sorry, Paul. You're always not mine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just thought of that one, but then it turns out to be fun and really wakes me up. Yeah. The movie caught my attention. It's very different from the dystopia yeah. um, things yeah. that we've been yeah. used to watching, and it's not hard to figure out like the other ones. Well, well, the what end, is real? Yeah, although well, the ending was a bit, so just oh, not just like kind of depressing. You know, the thing about the film was a lot more uplifting, whereas sort of the other ones like were kind of like trying to break you down. Yeah, I like unhappy endings. Um, it is, but it's, <laughs> I seem like the ending in <laughs> Doctor Horrible is slightly more cheerful. I mean, and when you do see... Well, he got what he wanted yeah. in the end, didn't he? Yeah. Because that's he what he wanted the whole time. So yeah, yeah. Able, yeah. He managed yeah. To get it. Even if he lost uh, part of his goodness, or all of it, yeah. at least he's there. Yeah. All of it. All of it. At least he's there with that horse. <laughs> and you, you, have to, you have to give a lot of credit to the writing for making, you know, the archetypal bad guy, good guy, to really question who is the hero, who is not the hero. Mm. And you pretty much hate the good guy. Yeah. 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 The right. bad guy is definitely more enduring. You are... Uh, so, thank you. That was our film review. And Juan Pablo Beltran, Jessica Chalmers, Colonel Lethley, and Cole Nabois, thank right. you. And would appreciate a night greatly. Right? Hey. <laughs> Have a nice day. Hey. Oh. Hey. How did you do it? A little A or a plus. No, that's a plus. A plus. Yeah, there we go. A plus. A plus. Yeah, no, it's good. Well, thank you. We're not going to see that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we're not going to see that. <laughs>